Sometimes we see people fall away from the faith. I've been a Christian since 1997. You know, it used to seem like it wasn't that long. I used to just, like, I'd, I'd want to, like, add more time and just be like, yeah, so I'd round up and I'd keep rounding up to, like, the next, the nearest number or whatever else. But, you know, it's, it's starting to get there a little bit where it's been almost, really, what's 90, so what's 2024 plus three is 27 years, so almost three decades. And uh, it's something that you see. It's something that you see happens that people fall away. Sometimes it's someone who seems extremely faithful for a time. Maybe you see someone in church every week, sometimes for several years, and then that person falls away. Maybe they seemed godly or spiritual, but then they're gone. They fall into some sin, maybe. Or maybe the sin was always there, I don't know. And they walk away from the faith. They choose this world or a cult, or sin, or something like that. That's the type of situation that Hebrews is dealing with. Really, throughout the letter at times, but in this passage in particular. Now, we can argue about whether or not a person like that was ever really saved. I mean, we know that perseverance is a characteristic of the genuinely saved. Genuinely saved people, they don't fully and finally fall away, never to return. But we also do know that sometimes genuine Christians backslide, right? That does happen. There are a lot of people in this room who are genuine Christians who who have backslidden at various points in, in their lives. But the theological part of this, was that person saved, is that person saved, whatever, that's not really, that's not really part of the point of today's conversation. Today's conversation kind of deals with the practical side of it. We must not fall away because Jesus is better. He is the way. He suffered and died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. He is an effective high priest who can overcome, who, who can help us overcome sin and temptation. And therefore, we need to fix our attention. And that's what we just saw in the last paragraph. We need to fix our attention on him because he is better. Haven't we seen that throughout the first two and plus chapters of Hebrews? He is better. And yet, even though it's clear that he's better, even though it's clear that he's better than angels, it's clear that he's better than Moses, it's clear that he's better than Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood, it's clear that he is better than his creation, even though all that's true, some of the Hebrews, the first century Hebrews, are in danger of falling away. They're in danger of returning to the Jewish sacrificial system. And that would be a terrible, terrible mistake. That would mean damnation. That would mean rejecting the only means of your salvation. And that principle that's true for the first century believer is true, or for the first century Jew, is true for the 21st century church person. We must not fall away. Let's take a look at Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 9 for now. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. So you, you have this, this first statement here, uh, this first word I mean here, which is, uh, which is therefore. So this is like, this is the logical conclusion, what we've just seen here. We've just seen Jesus' faithfulness. We've just seen, well, really, we just saw Moses' faithfulness too, but we saw that Jesus was faithful as a son, whereas Moses was faithful as a servant. We also saw that we are part of God's house as long as we remain faithful. Again, perseverance being a sign of genuine faith, so we must not fall away. 
with, with that in mind, he says these words, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and he quotes Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. Now we're going to go there in a second, not just yet. But what's interesting is he doesn't say, therefore, just as the psalmist, the, the, the palmist, as Joe Biden calls him. This is the psalmist. He, doesn't, he says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says. The writer of Hebrews recognizes what Scripture makes clear, the inspiration of of God's truth, that God's word is breathed out by him. That's what the word inspired means. Theopneustos, in, 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 all, all scripture is given by inspiration. It's breathed out, it's the breath of God. Psalm 95, the passage that's about to be quoted along with the rest of scripture is breathed out by God, born along by God's Holy Spirit. And that's something that the apostle Paul, just to remind some of you, the apostle Paul, most of you shouldn't, this should be review for most of you guys, what the Apostle Paul wrote too, and he's, he's functioning as a pastor of pastors, and he's writing to a pastor, a young pastor named Timothy, who's pastoring a church in the city of Ephesus, which is kind of like Ephesus was in, uh, well, you know what, if you're, if you're interested, um, no, that map's not going to show us. Uh, we'll just real quick go here. Ephesus is in Western modern Turkey. And Ephesus, it's in, in a region called Asia Minor. And it, it's the base that the Apostle Paul uses to get the gospel all over this region. All over, if you remember the seven churches of Asia and all that stuff. Ephesus is, is basically Paul's headquarters to get the gospel out to all these places. And now Timothy is pastoring Ephesus. And what Paul writes to Timothy in, second, in the second letter to Timothy very near the end of his life, like his last words, these are some of the last words the Apostle Paul writes before he ends up being killed. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And the purpose of it is so that the man of God may be mature, adequate. Uh, King James says perfect, but the idea is mature. Uh, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Equipped for every good work. So, so scripture is breathed out by God. When you're reading, when you open up your Bible, it's one of the reasons this book is so important. It's one of the reasons why, listen, when you're around me, so I had to go to a synagogue. I had to go to a I had to go to a, a mosque in seminary. And that was freaky because uh, you know, some terrorist stuff was going on in other parts of the world. And you know, you go in there, you you gotta take your shoes off in the first place. And I don't really love doing that among strangers. And I don't really love their shoes off around me, to be honest with you. Because, you know, not everybody, you know, takes care of their the smell of their feet so well, you know what I mean? But anyway, you're in this room and they're doing this whole ritual. And, and I remember at one point, there was some type of conversation about respect for a book. Uh, like if we were gonna bring our Quran in, we could not place the Quran on the seat or on the floor or anything like that. Now I believe this long before I saw anything like that. I don't base any of my thinking on Muslim thinking. But there's, the point I'm trying to make is they have such a high respect for their false teaching, for their, their false book, that their belief is that they, hold, they have to hold the Quran here. So when they walk around, they have to hold the Quran over their heart. That's like one of their rules. I don't think we necessarily have to do any of that. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. But there's something about me seeing a Bible on the ground that bothers me. Now, if you're laying on the ground and you have the Bible on the ground reading it, I can, that's okay. I've done that many times. But if you're like, okay, uh, hold on a second and put the Bible on the ground, I'm like, oh, I might just go pick it up and put it on a seat or something because I, 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 I walk on the ground. I don't know. There's like, 
the point I'm trying to make is there's nothing Bible about that, but it's, to, to me, there's like a respect thing because what we have here is when you open up this book, you're reading what God says. God is speaking to us through his word. He's not giving us subliminal messages or clues about life. He's telling us what he thinks and what he wants. But when you look at scripture, you have to look at context. Is this true? You have to look at one of those words, we, one of those statements, we, context is king. A guy came to our services. Just give me a sec, I'm going to get back on track here. <laughs> a guy came to uh, one of our services a few weeks ago. And, uh, and he says to me, all the seminaries are wrong. All the seminaries are wrong. Now, he had come here before and said that to me. But, uh, so if you heard this before, it's because he did it before. Uh, he came a few weeks ago. All the seminaries are wrong, but my research is right. That's what he told me. And I, I, I'm here to be the pastor to the pastors, is what he said to me. <laughs> just like, so every seminary is wrong, even though you've never been to any seminary, but your research is right. What's that sound like? Everybody else is wrong. I'm right. That sounds like a cult. You know, that sounds like, I don't know, like Jim, Joe, don't drink the Kool-Aid. You know what I mean? So what I told them ultimately was, hey, listen, you know, um, if you want to be the pastor to the pastors, then go to seminary, get trained, and do it through the proper channels. You know, don't try to go into a church and just, like, take some, some position that, you know, you haven't been, like, nobody's looked at your life. You know, you haven't done the study, you haven't put the work in, you know, that type of stuff. But anyway, he's, I said to him, uh, I said, no, my, my seminary didn't do it wrong. My seminary didn't do it wrong. He said, how do you know? And I said, because my seminary taught us to look at context. It taught us a detailed formula for studying the Bible that included, con the first thing we looked at was immediately preceding context, immediately following context. We looked at authorial context. We looked at historical context. We looked at all this, and you know, that comes out, right? Doesn't that come out in the messages? You're, you're hearing all that context. So you understand the context. That's what we start with. And then we would go to like word possibilities. What, what are all the possible meanings of this word? And then word choice and, and so on and so forth. And this like six step method of biblical interpretation. So I said a couple of those things to him, and he said, the Holy Spirit doesn't need context. I almost kicked him right out of the building. <laughs> it's just like, oh man, you, you just, it's like insulting, it's like insulting someone's mom. You know, you just don't do that. You don't tell me that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God doesn't need context. The Spirit of God only works through what he wrote in context. But this guy was saying that the Spirit of God was revealing truth of the Bible to him that no one else knew and that the pastors needed his research and that he didn't need context because he had the Holy Spirit. It's just so wild because you could make the Bible say anything you wanted to say if you base it on your subjective feelings. That's why we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, right? You understand this? There's a big difference between that and the Holy Spirit told me that, you know, I was in college once and, you know, the Holy Spirit told me that we were going to get married, someone says to someone else. And the other person's like, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me that. When you interpret based on context, you're seeing what God actually said to those people at that time. And therefore, when I understand what God said to those people at that time, I can look at it and, and apply what he said to those people at that time. Take those, those timeless principles and put them into practice today. That's how I figure out what God said. And so it's context. God speaks to us today through his word in context. We see something about the importance of the Word of God in Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the vision of soul and spirit of both joints and marrows and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's Word is powerful and active and it knows what's, God knows what's going on in your heart. And God's Word is able to reveal to you what's going on in your heart and pierce and bring conviction I know that's not the point of Hebrews 3. If it's hard for me to see a quote like, just as the Spirit says, and not at least deal with this for a few minutes. 
the inspiration of God. Now, I want to take a closer look at the passage that Hebrews is citing. Because one of the things we've tried to do throughout Hebrews, when we had the chance, is if I want to understand what Hebrews is teaching, then I want to understand what Hebrews is quoting. Right? Because Hebrews is quoting a lot of times, Old Testament. So I need, to, I, need to look, I need to go back and I need to look at Psalm 95. Psalm 95. Let's go there. Psalm 95. Psalm 95, so in verses 1 and and verse uh, 2, we see praise and and we see thanksgiving and praise. Uh, Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. By the way, we could talk about that. Let us sing for gloom. Now, we joke. We joke. Matt and I, you know, every time I walk in this building, Matt's playing a hymn, and then I hear it as I'm walking into my office. I hear him drop into a minor key, which makes it sound dark and brooding, and it's funny. And and I'll if 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 I get a chance, I'll come out and I'll I'll give him a little thumbs up, and then he'll drop back up. He'll he'll go back up into the normal key. You know, we kind of we kind of have fun with that. But it's not sing for gloom, right? It's not like "Mm, you know, uh, I am. I have decided to follow Jesus. Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be a child. You know, (laughs) sing for joy. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. We're seeing praise. We're seeing thanksgiving and praise. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. This call towards worship and and song here. Uh, We see why we should worship like that. Maybe some people don't understand why, but we see why. For, this is why, the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. We see his creative work. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So we see this call to praise and to sing for the Lord joyfully. We see why, because of his greatness. We come back to that that praise of the Lord again in verses 6 and 7, the beginning of verse 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And from there, the psalm moves into a warning against unbelief. So you have praise in the first part of the psalm and thanksgiving for who God is, for what he's done, and then we move into warning. And this is the part that Hebrews quotes. Don't Harden your heart. Praise and thanksgiving. Bow down before him. He is a great God. Don't harden your heart. You have the positive encouragement to praise and to submit to him and the negative encouragement to not fall away. Today, if you would hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness. And we'll come back to that in a second from the New Testament quote. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation, verse 10, and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. We see their spiritual failure, and we see judgment. Therefore, I swore in my anger. Truly, they shall not enter into my rest. So we go back to the Hebrews quote. This is the portion that Hebrews quotes. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit said, that that spirit that breathed out God's truth, right, that he moved men of God along, He borne them along as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. Today, if you hear his voice. Here we see urgency. We see uh, the need for people to hear what God says 
now, today. They cannot delay. By the way, this, this phrase, today, if you hear his voice, shows up three times in the letter to the Hebrews. So there's the urgency of listening to what God says here and now. And this is the conditional part. If you hear his voice. Because we know that some people won't hear it. We know that some people will reject it. But if you hear his voice, if you're hearing what God says, do not harden your hearts. We must not have a stubborn and obstinate heart to God's truth. That's, that's the idea that's here in Harding. We must not rebel against what God says. We must not refuse to listen to his truth. We must not turn away from it as those early Hebrews did during the Exodus generation. As Pharaoh did. Pharaoh hardened his heart over and over again until God gave him over to his own wickedness. And what happened with Pharaoh? Pharaoh. It resulted in his destruction. He lost his kingdom, basically. He lost his army. He lost the most important thing in his life. His firstborn son. There are consequences to hardening your heart against God. The Exodus generation provoked. Look at the language that's here. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. They provoked the Lord their God. The Exodus, that's, that's a reference to the people who left Egypt. They, they were slaves in Egypt, and they left to go, and hopefully what they were supposed to do was go inherit the promised land. But instead, they rebelled against the Lord. You might remember the account of the 12 spies that were sent out to, to, to spy out the land. Hey, go check out the land. And they went and they checked out the land and said, yeah, the land is certainly, it is... It is a land flowing with milk and honey. That is, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful land for, for pasturing flocks and for, for, for living off the land and surviving off. It's, it's a land flow. It wasn't literally, I mean, it wasn't literally flowing like you didn't get to the Jordan. I say this all the time. That's why we use context, right? It's a figure of speech. You don't get to the Jordan River and all of a sudden, like, you have to trudge through uh, 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 several feet of, of, of milk and, and honey, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a land flowing. It's a, it's a metaphor. This is a, this, is a, this is a bountiful land. Yeah! But, you know, the sons of the Anakim are there. These guys are mighty and powerful, and we won't be able to conquer them. They weren't sent out to make a report about foreign policy or about war just to go and scout out the land. And yet they discouraged the people from taking the land. They discouraged the people from doing what God said. And they encouraged the people to go back to Egypt. And Israel heard that report, you might remember, and, and they ignored those, they ignored what Caleb said, and they listened to those spies. All the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation says, and would, I wish that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in this desert. Said we followed you fools around to be killed by these people. They grumbled against the Lord. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Man, man, they hardened their hearts against God. Go down a, a few verses later, down in verse 22. Uh, that generation would, uh, surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs, which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to, these, to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, they will by no means, shall by no means see the land which I swore to the fathers, nor shall any of those who spurned me see it. They'll die in this wilderness. And so Israel rebelled against the Lord at Kadesh. They rebelled against the Lord at Meribah and Massa, which we see, we see uh, referred to in Psalm 97, uh, Psalm 95, where God asked Moses to strike the rock and water came out. That was at Meribah and Massa. They'd grumble again later on and Moses himself would fall when God 
told Moses to speak to the rock and instead he struck it and he cost himself. He took God's glory upon himself and cost himself the promised land. And so when you look at this passage, do, today if you hear his voice, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. They tested him 10 times. They rebelled against God from the moment they left Egypt and they continued to do it throughout their desert, wandering, desert wanderings and therefore they saw his works for 40 years. They, spent, they saw the miraculous provision of God for those 40 years and the provision of manna and they also saw the judgment of God when they died in the desert according to what God had said. Hebrews makes this point clear based on Israel's history don't harden your hearts. Don't be like rebellious Israel, that stiff-necked and rebellious generation. Don't fall away like Israel did. Israel heard the truth. They, they heard his voice. And yet they provoked him. They tested him. To the first century Hebrew and to the 21st century church person, don't make that same mistake they made. We must not fall away. We must not fall away, because if we do, and this is really the second movement in this passage, we must not fall away. That's the charge. That's the command. That's the imperative. We must not do it because if we do, we'll face the judgment of God. Just like Israel did. Look at verses 10 and 11. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. The first, the first idea that we're seeing here is that God was angry with this generation. God's anger was a result. You see that word, therefore. It was a result of their rebellion. Now, I understand some people don't like this. They don't like to believe that God has anger and wrath. Some people like to believe only in the, the characteristic of love for God. God is love. And they like to believe that God is loving and accepting of everybody, no matter what sin they're carrying out or what their personal opinions and beliefs are. That's their view of God. But here we see that God has anger and wrath. And it's clear not just here, it's clear in the Bible, that's what God shows us in his word. That God has perfectly just wrath against sin and evil. And in his, perfect, his perfection, he, he, he has a perfect justice where sin must be punished. That's why hell exists. Hell exists to satisfy God's demand for a just penalty. In the same way that if someone murdered or raped somebody that you loved, you'd want judgment. Like right now, what we're going through with my, with my dad a little bit. You know, my dad, 75-year-old man, got popped in the face by some guy that walked out of the courthouse. Just comes out of the courthouse, he's angry, he's grumbling. My dad doesn't even see it coming. He's, he's you know, this is my dad. He's 75, he's walking, he's, how about it? Is that what he looks like? Is you know, minding his own business, boom, gets punched in the face. We want justice, right? We want to see this guy, we want to see a felony. Could have killed my dad. And meanwhile, the charges are like minor. They're like a slap in the wrist. They're like all misdemeanor things. We don't feel like that's right. You know what I mean? There are people in my family that are thinking like, hey, just let them out. <laughs> just let them out. <laughs> Street justice will take care of itself. You know what I mean? Like, there's a, there's a sense of justice. Well, God is perfectly just. God is perfectly just, and he must punish sin. This is why hell exists. This is why the gospel is so important. God has, avoided, God has provided a way to avoid those consequences in that he himself paid that penalty. He himself paid the penalty for your sins, a penalty you could never pay for. He has provided the way to life 
through faith alone in the cross. But here, God is angry with Israel because of their sinful and rebellious character. He was angry with this generation, and he said they always go astray in their heart. It's not an occasional thing. This is who they were. Their hearts continually went off the path of godliness to unrighteousness. And that's because, it's because they did not know his ways. Their hearts went astray because they did not know God's ways. They didn't understand God's truth. Or more accurately, they may have understood it, but they rejected what God said. They rejected it. And their spiritual ignorance led to their spiritual rebellion. Is that true today? Does that happen today? You better believe that happens today. So many people, first off, so many people are ignorant of what God says. And that leads to all kinds of bad theology. And it leads to all kinds of sinful living. Because so many people are ignorant of what God says. They don't know what God says. They don't study the word of God in context. They'll say ridiculously stupid things like, I don't, the Holy Spirit doesn't need context. Everybody's wrong and I'm right. You know, that type of stupid stuff. Moreover, so many people who do know a bit of what God says, they don't live what God says. They don't know it in practice. They reject what God says. They may know a lot about Scripture. They may be able to quote a lot of Bible verses. But a lot of people who know or claim to know Scripture reject it. And that leads to lawlessness, living as if God doesn't exist. And that takes them down a dark path that leads to hell. That's Israel. That's the first generation of Israelites out of the Exodus. They faced the wrath of God. They were not willing to listen to what God said. They became hardened in their rebellion against him. They faced the consequences. They saw God's wrath. His anger was roused against their rebellion. And his anger is always perfectly just. You could say, hey, look, you could look at us. And, and when we get angry, it's very seldom righteous anger. Most of us are impulsively angry. We, get, we see something that angers us and we react. That's us. Every once in a while, we become righteously angry over something. But even that righteous anger is probably tainted somehow by, human, by, by sinful nature. God has a righteous and perfectly just wrath. And the result was, they shall not enter my rest. The Exodus generation would not inherit the promised land. Check this out. We go back to Numbers 14 and verses 30 through 35. Surely <coughs> you shall not come into the land. You shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. He didn't have a father. He didn't. It's actually pronounced Nun. In Hebrew, it's Joshua, the son of Nun. But um, that was his dad. He had a dad. I'm just teasing. Except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said they would become a prey, the ones you said would die in this wilderness, I'll bring them in. And they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpses... Your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. Man. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, and they will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses lie dead in the wilderness. They're going to they're gonna face the consequences of the sin that I'm pouring out on you according to the number of days which you spied out in the land. It's, it's kind of like the kids pay the price sometimes. You know, do the kids pay? Do the kids suffer when the parents divorce? They, they suffer. 
they suffer. Your sons, and, 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 and all you have to do is ask divorced people if the kids suffer. That's all you have to do. If they've been, did, did the kids suffer through the, yeah, of course they did. Of course they did. When I was a kid, I thought my parents were going to divorce, and there was a question as to who I would live with. In my mind, I had to work out, who was I going to live with? Would I live with my mom? You know, my mom's always there. You know, she, I don't think she really worked all, she didn't work all the time, if at all, sometimes. My dad was always working. I was like, man, well, how are we going to survive if I live with my mom? Yet my dad's the one who makes the money, but he's never around. And, you know, there's, the kids suffer. The kids suffer. And that would, that's the same thing is true here. They suffered because of the parents, the consequence of the parents' sin. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness. They will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your dead bodies lie in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, for every day you shall bear your guilt for one year, even 40 years, and you will know my opposition I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this I will do to all this evil congregation. And that's what they were. They were evil. To this evil congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall be destroyed and there they will die. They could have inherited the land flowing with milk and honey. They could have entered into the rest of their Lord. Instead, they spent 40 years in the desert. And by the way, the desert lands of, uh, it's like just, it's like rocks and desolation. Barely even a lizard could survive in these places. 40 years wandering aimlessly in the desert. And then they died. Only Caleb and Joshua entered into the promised land of that generation. By the way, this quote, they shall not enter my rest, another one that shows up three times in Hebrews, twice in Hebrews 4 and and here. It's part of a significant warning to the New Testament believers. Don't fall away or you will suffer the consequences. In, In this passage we see rebellion and its consequences. We see Israel rebelling against the Lord in the desert, and we see the consequences, judgment from the Lord. That same warning, Hebrews Hebrews takes that warning and issues the same warning to the first century Hebrew reader. Those Hebrews who are listening, who are reading, more likely listening because, because uh, in, in that day, you know, uh, what, what do you call it when people can't read uh, and people can read uh, literacy? <laughs> I'm going to develop a school for kids who don't read good. Um, and literacy, literacy rates were lower, right? So um, in, in that day, they may have more listened to it than read it. Maybe listen to it in their local congregation or the local assembly, and for the first century Hebrews who were listening to it, they're hearing this warning, and they're, they, they needed to understand that Jesus is better. He provides salvation that no one else can provide. He provides life that no one else can provide, and so the charge for them in that first century is don't fall away. Don't return to the Jewish sacrificial system which could never fully remove the penalty of sin, which could never finally pay the penalty for sin. Don't fall away to that system. If the first century Hebrew were to fall away, they would be giving up a much greater inheritance than even the people of Israel. The people of Israel were giving up the the promised land. They would be giving up salvation. Not that they had it, but they were giving up by rejecting the only means of their salvation. They'd be giving up an eternal inheritance, eternal life. They'd be, going, they'd be foregoing God's salvation in order to inherit damnation. And so we're seeing that, that first, uh, you know, the, the, the exodus takes place in 1446, so we're talking, what's that, 5th century, 15th century B.C. Jew. We're seeing a message about those guys applied to the 1st century Hebrew. And we're seeing that message applied, we know, 
that it's applied, it, it's, a, it's a timeless principle for us, the 21st century. It's a message of warning, really, that has spanned, what's 21 and 14, 3,500 years of human history. The warning hasn't changed. For those who hear God's truth, who place their faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross and who remain faithful, they will inherit the promise. They will enter into his rest. They will spend eternity with him. They will have everlasting life. But given that we're talking about people who fell away in the 15th century BC, the 1446 to 1406, the Exodus generation, and given that that warning is applied to the first century Hebrew, I have to think about the 21st century person who falls away. Look what they're giving up. And if you're tempted to fall away, look what you're giving up. And for what? For sex? For hedonistic pleasure? For money? For a career? For drugs? For alcohol? For some short-lived temporary happiness? The pleasures of sin which are for a season? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Even if you think it might be worth it, even if it feels worth it at the moment, it's not worth it. Don't fall away from him and give up everything that he wants you to have. We must not fall away. You must not fall away or else you'll face the judgment of God just like Israel did. And the price may be greater than you can bear. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes for a brief moment of invitation, just you, me, and God. Again, no one looking around. You're here today and you're not sure you're saved. You're not sure you're going to heaven when you die. You say, if I die today, I, I just don't know. I don't know for sure where I would go. Would you just raise your hand up for me? I'd like to pray for you. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven if I die today, but I'd like to I'd like to be sure. Would you just raise your hand up for me? You're in this room and you're confident of your salvation, but uh, sin, sin has been knocking at the door, and God is convicting you about that. And um, perhaps you've been tempted to, to give in to that sin. Or maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's you're, 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 you're less further along the track that God, God has been convicting you about some stuff in your life that can become obstacles that can draw you away from him or that those things are drawing you. Whatever the case is, God is, con- God, God is working on your heart and you you want to repent about something that's going on in your life. Would you just lift your hand and pray for you privately? There's something that God is speaking to me about through the convicting work of the Spirit that I need to give over to him. Anyone? See that? I see that. Heavenly Father, we come before you, none of us being worthy all of us in heart being stiff-necked and rebellious at some level. But knowing what you say, we receive your truth. It tells us not to fall away, not to harden our hearts, as in the day when the people of Israel tested you those ten times in the desert. We receive that And we pray that you would 
have your people hear that and be committed to remaining faithful to you and persevering in their walk, regardless of the wiles of the devil and the fiery darts of the evil one that he continues to send our way. I pray for anyone in this room who isn't saved. I pray that you would do a convicting work until they turn and repent and get saved. I pray for these who have felt the convicting work of your spirit in several aspects in their lives or whatever aspects they are in their lives. And I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them and continue to convict them and continue to use them for you and for your glory and that you would protect them from, that you would put a hedge of protection around them so that the evil one can't get to them. I pray for one more group of people in this room and I don't know who they are but you would know for people who might need to be convicted and aren't. And I pray that you would continue to work fresh conviction in their lives or work fresh conviction in their lives until they turn and repent. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 332. If you take your handles and turn to 332. Uh, we're...